My name is Tim Barrett. Uh, I'm the director of the Center for the Book, and I represent a hands-on component for this Mellon seminar. Uh, I'm about to introduce Yasmin Khan and tell you about many of her qualifications, but I'll tell you none of them compare with the fact she and Melissa Morton together over the last two or three weeks, more than that, actually four or five weeks, have figured out how to have 30 people in an Islamic style binding with a double end band in six hours tomorrow. <laughs> how, they, how they've done this, I have no idea, but it's really pretty good. And Sarah and Elise and Johan. Yes, <laughs> with a lot of good help from the hands on assistance for the Mellon Summoner, so thanks to them as well. Yasmin Khan is a senior book conservator at the Conservation Division of the Library of Congress, where she has worked since 1996. Through her conservation, uh, though her conservation work involves treatment of all types of paper and parchment manuscripts and books, her research is focused on the characterization of bookmaking and its associated crafts in the Middle East and South Asia, and the development of techniques for the preservation of bound manuscripts and printed books from the same geographic area. She has taught and consulted extensively. Her publications include technical studies of early Arabic parchment leaves and Armenian bindings, conservation treatments of manuscripts and bindings, research into treatment development for iron gall ink, and the evolution of conservation practice. Please join me in welcoming Yasmin Khan. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me? I have a pretty soft voice, so I might peter out and just end up talking to myself, so just to yell. Um, so, um, so I'm starting out with uh, the slide, which basically is of the Library of Congress, because I'm going to be talking about um, the uh, collections at the library and my treatment and the evolution of my ideas based on my treatments over there. And also, since this is work time, I should plug my institution, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, this, most of the, nearly everything I'm going to talk about is from the African and Middle Eastern um, division. This is the reading room. Um, they have a collection of about uh, 40,000 rare uh, books in uh, the Near East section, which covers um, Arabic, Persian, um, Georgian, Syriac, uh, Armenian, and um, most probably a few other languages in there. Um, here is a, a bay in which um, some of the manuscripts are kept. This is the only one that has um, the manuscripts open. Everything else is in boxes, so the other bays are very, very boring. They're all <laughs> either gray or yellow. Um, uh, the, um, so the library has been collecting Islamic material since its inception. Um, I think uh, Thomas Jefferson was interested in Islam. He was interested in the figure of Muhammad. Um, and, uh, collected English language and, you know, European language material um, associated with him. And I believe um, uh, Doris, uh, no, uh, Professor Spellberg at the University of uh, Texas has written a book about Thomas Jefferson and the Quran. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about his relationship with, with that. Um, and subsequently, the library continued to acquire material, uh, often um, the Princeton University or the Harvard University specialists who would go off to the Middle East to do so on a buying jaunt in the 19th century would buy material for the library and uh, pass stuff off to us. And it would go into the Orientalia division, which was basically everything that wasn't um, in a Western language. So Hebrew, from Hebrew to uh, Javanese, it was all in that division. Um, between the uh, two world wars, um, Henry Putnam was a librarian of Congress, and he um, very uh, was, you know, really wanted to increase the international collections at the library, and um, actively um, created relationships with various dealers. 
um, in Europe and in the US. And so they, they provided a lot of material. Um, and uh, up to the present, the library continues to buy rare material on a yearly basis, on an annual basis. And um, the library's acquisition budget for rare material is far exceeds many museums' library budget they, because they buy in all the areas of collecting um, a rare material. Very, very, it's a juggernaut. Um, so most of my presentation is going to deal with um, treatments and books that I've seen that um, focus or from the 15th to the 19th century as the earlier material that we have consider this small oblong um, Quran fragment has been, was treated for sale by um, dealers in Europe and the Middle East. And since there's little justification to disbind this, take this out of this binding, and I don't think taking it apart is going to actually yield that much more information considering the way it's been put together. So I haven't had to look at this as closely as I would an object that I treat, which we'll see. So um, other early fragments, we have many, many um, leaves from the Quran. Um, I think this is dated a little later than you would date it, Francois? Ninth and seventh. So, um, um, and uh, most of the identifying information has been provided by the, um, the record, where the record exists. So we have many, many of these fragments that are single leaves and that were um, sold to the library and to other institutions around the US and Europe by um, dealers who would break up the manuscripts. Um, and so, you know, they, there is some discussion about creating virtual copies by having museums around the world and specifically the US talk to each other because this dealer specifically um, sold many manuscripts to um, the freer um, New York Public Library, Harvard, Princeton, you name it. Um, so another thing, once he took the manuscripts out of bindings, he would then sell the binding. Um, so we have a large collection of about um, 75 to 100 man uh, manuscript uh, bindings. And clearly, um, and he would uh, take this, this uh, binding would, know, would never be on the manuscript that I showed you before. This is a later um, uh, Turkish binding. But he um, would fix up the binding before selling it, have his restorers fix them up. So here, you, the inside, the other side of the binding, that's the spine area. You would never know that a book was ever in this binding. Um, so, uh, so all traces of the manuscript would have, that were bound in it would have been removed. And the numbered labels that you see here are um, associated with the dealer, Keiko Manassian's um, uh, inventory. And you can always see these labels as well. And uh, Harvard actually has the papers, his, many of his papers, which they've digitized and put online. So you can actually go and access his, uh, his sales catalogs. Um, and I don't know what else he sold. He could have sold apartment as well, for all we know. So um, I'm going to be showing you a cross section of um, some of the books that we have at the library. Um, most of them are very quotidien bindings, um, and many of them are repetitions of things that uh, Francois showed you. Um, but I think it's worth looking at them again. The more one sees, the better it is. Um, so here is a um, drawing of the, uh, the link stitch, which is the most basic stitch to attach a series of choirs or gatherings together. Um, and this is also, and, and this drawing was done in 1983 for a publication that came out in 1983. Um, and this is the um, sewing that you will all be doing tomorrow, the ones, uh, the, the, those of you who are in the workshop. Um, and uh, 
but you know some of the assigned read readings and uh, show that this is one of many possibilities that were used in the Muslim world to attach uh, leaves together to make a book. Um, this is, however, the one that's most commonly found I have, for me, for my institution, and um, it's the simplest. And it's, it is such an easy way to sew a book that anyone could do it. And you can actually, um, as Professor de Roche said, you could be a scholar and be a binder and be on the road. And the equivalent if in, in Western bookbinding, if you were, the transition would be going from a book bound on cords to going to a, I think, uh, a publisher's binding, you know, a more uh, recent publisher's binding, which is a very, very simple way of putting a book together that's hardy. And that will last for as long as you need it to last before you can put another book uh, a cover on it. Um, so the paper that would, you know, we've, uh, Francois go, gone over how the paper would have been prepared for, um, uh, to make the book. So the hardest part of making a book was actually uh, making the paper, burnishing the paper, preparing it for a calligraphy and illumination. And then once all that hard work was done, this was the easiest part of making a book. There are other things that are going to happen that are a little more complicated, but sewing the gatherings together was the easiest part. Um, after the gathering was sewn, a cloth liner would be attached, and I'm going to send this around, and this, so, so this book that I'm sending around shows how the book's been sewn, a cloth liner has been attached, and a primary sewing has been done um, over the cloth liner. It goes over a leather thong and provides um, the weft. Uh, if, if you, you know, it provides a base through which a secondary end band can be sewn, can be woven, because it's pretty much woven. And that weave provides you with um, the basic design um, element, which is a chevron. But because that weave, it's basically like weaving cloth, which is, I think, something that was very common in the Middle East anyway, um, you can actually use these primary um, threads to, sh to weave many, many different designs, not just the chevron. And um, when you look at Islamic manuscripts, you do actually see a variety of um, end band um, de design, woven designs. And one of my colleagues has uh, translated a poem, I believe, which mentions the moustache and the caterpillar and the bird seed. And so we don't know what these meant, but apparently there was, there's a uh, romantic, you know, there's literature that sort of romanticizes the end band. Um, so here, um, to show you a little bit more clearly how it really relates to um, weaving is the top, um, the, the top uh, picture. And the bottom one shows you how the end band functions when you open a book. These threads here, which would be the equivalent of the ones here, exert a tension on the book as it opens. The book wants to close, it wants to keep closing back. Um, so this diagram shows the various components of uh, Professor de Roche's type 2 binding with its characteristic four edge flap and um, four edge and envelope flap and um, spine attachment. So that's the attachment of the linen spine lining, which attaches um, the text, reinforces the text to binding the book cover attachment and the four edge flap. Um, the leather is turned in at the head and tail over here to create um, an end cap. So the book block is flush with 
uh, is the same height as the boards of the book. So this is a diagram from the Islamic Binding and Bookmaking uh, publication exhibition catalogue published by Gulnar Borsh and Guy Petherbridge in 1983 and is used to train conservators on what an Islamic binding is and has been used since that time. Um, and the reason why is that Petherbridge was a conservator and teacher of conservation at graduate programs at, uh, in library and archives conservation, first at Columbia and then I think he went to Australia. Um, and his, question, his work was, take, was unquestioned by conservators until mm, mm, recently. And um, Gulnar Bosch um, did his PhD at, in Chicago on uh, Mamluk bindings and um, Mamluk covers, especially when Chicago had a large collection, many of them provided by a dealer who we saw what the dealer's bindings book covers looked like. So they were, some of them were quite well restored. And so his understanding of what um, an Islamic book cover might be was, a, you know, along with Petherbridge, it kind of got simplified in a way. And this looks very much the um, attachment of the uh, text block to the cover is is more like a Western binding in a way, and the insistence on turning in the end cap as well, as we will see. Though again, there's a great variety in Islamic bindings, so um, nothing is the jury still out. So uh, my, um, so my uh, map is very um, colorful, because that's the only one I could find. Um, so I'm going to go through a, a bunch of bindings from, you know, going, starting from Timbuktu and ending up in um, Java, in Indonesia. So this is um, a binding from Timbuktu, and it's single leaf, single sheets, a Quran. Um, it's a simple leather cover with a tacketed, um, with tacketed ties on the front to hold it closed. There's been reuse of um, uh, paper in the in the cover, in the wrapper, and uh, the spine of the wrapper is also reinforced with paper, which is a little unusual if you're used to talking about um, typifying an Islamic binding with Gulnar Bosch's. Um, uh, with Petherbridge's drawing. Um, so I was, you know, the librarian from Timbuktu, the famous Mama Haidara was at the library and we were looking at materials from this area that the library holds. And um, he said that as far as he learned and the law that was sent down to him by his family who have a very famous library in Timbuktu, um, the single leaves were were for students because they could multiple students could work on a manuscript at the same time. Somebody could be reading it. Somebody could be copying it. You could be um, reading. Three people could be reading reading the Quran at the same time in different at, the, at different points. So he felt that it um, was a format that was more um, flexible as opposed to a certain format and that Timbuktu being a famous center, a famous center of Islamic learning after the fall of Spain, um, sort of became a nexus for, for students in North Africa to come study. This, this is, whether this is true or not is, this is his, what he believes. Um, in Morocco, this is a Moroccan binding, and this is 19, late 19th century, and um, Again, a type two, uh, t it's a type two binding. Um, the cover is, uh, the four edge flap is um, tooled on the outside. And um, this is the end cap, which instead of being turned in is sort of cut in a little tab. And underneath it is the um, end band with the primary sewing. And there's no secondary sewing, there's no weaving of the chevron on this. Um, about five years, four years ago, I was in uh, the National Library of Qatar, and um, they had bought a 
collection of books from Morocco from a scholar, and every single book in his um, collection was bound in a similar fashion to the point where um, even the tools were the same. So this is a printed book, by the way, and it's um, stab sewn for those who are interested. So either it was uh, collectors. I, I haven't been able to figure out if the library bought this from the same collector. Um, um, this is an early 19th century Quran from Egypt, and we have a very large collection of um, material um, from Egypt that we bought from this um, particular um, scholar. And all of them are bound in a similar manner, or disbound. These are single, these are choirs or gatherings that haven't been attached together. Some of them have, um, show remnants of adhesive, and others you can actually open the box and there's a little thin tissue, colored tissue usually, attached over here and over here, just to hold it together. Um, and you know, possibly, and we're also going to see one of these um, similar material um, later this evening in, in your collection here at the University of Iowa. Princeton University has a large collection as well, and theirs is, I think, in a, a couple of thousands of uh, sort of these these dis unbound manuscripts that um, with their slip cases that they fit fit into. Um, So this is a Turkish binding, 70 dated, with a with a colophon that states where it was. Um, it shows again the um, they've removed uh, part of the board to inset the design. Um, and um, at this point, and a little earlier, starting from a little earlier, you start seeing the use of Western wallpaper as end sheets with a high gloss and um, uh, and for edge painting and you know, edge painting on the head and book of the spine. Um, and unlike the uh, Moroccan binding, the, the 19th century Moroccan binding, um, this one is decorated on the inside of the for edge flap as well as the outside. So there. Um, this one is uh, a Persian manuscript. Um, and again, it has a doublure that is also wallpaper, but not as pretty as the other one, or different. It's, it's, and it's been cut in a sort of a zigzag manner. And, a, and a, um, so you see that, and it's got, um, the, um, the binding extends beyond the text block. So in Gulnar Bosch's, uh, in uh, Bosch and Pletherbridge's drawing, the text, um, the book block was flush with the boards, the front and back boards. Here, the boards extend a little bit. Here, they extend a little bit beyond that. And there's an end cap, the leather's turned in. Um, so here's a later Iranian binding. I'm going to show us two of these, similar to this, where um, these are called frame frame bindings. Uh, a colleague of a curator conservator uh, Jake Benson has done a lot of work on these, and um, so they're late 19th century and. This one has um, a frame. They're usually two-piece bindings, um, type two of type three. Is that type three, Francois? Yeah, of uh, um, Professor de Roche's type three binding, because um, there's no four-edge flap. However, the spine, each um, board is made separately, and they're overlapped on the spine. Um, and they frame, in this case, they frame an exotic material. So the exotic material here is alum toured leather, um, or something more 
you know, considered beautiful. But anyway, alum told leather was the exotic material here. Um, and uh, the text is an older text that's been inset, inlaid into um, blue colored paper, which we have seen already. So, um, but that was a way to, to uh, and it could possibly be because not just beauty in this particular case, but because the older text, there's a lot of uh, insect damage that you see in materials from the Middle East. So, um, and again, you can see Manassian's number. Um, this is a similar piece, and I just wanted to show this one because you can see where the two boards, the front and back board, overlap at the spine. And this is the kind of we're going to be making a binding tomorrow where they overlap at the spine, because that's the easiest way to get you all through um, a complete binding. It's not going to look quite so pretty, because um, you don't have this. Um, it's not an inlay. You're not doing a frame binding. But this frame binding, the uh, piece inside is a very, very early Kashmiri shawl, which um, the, uh, conserv the curator at the Textile Museum um, Gulruch um, said uh, that uh, it's very early and quite, quite uh, valuable. And so in Iran it would have been prized, which makes sense. This is um, from uh, Central Asia, possibly Tajikistan, close to Xinjiang somewhere. Um, and the only reason I say that is because books have been found in China um, in, uh, that are um, attributed to Xinjiang and have, are in fact, exactly the same binding and possibly the same binder. Um, here the end band has been trimmed and there's a fringe. So, and also the um, text block is completely, uh, the boards are flush, were flush at some point and have um, have uh, worn away with time. Here's another one. So you've got the fringe, but in and this is your cloth liner, spine lining. So instead of the spine lining going over and sticking to the board, they stuck it to the book. I don't know how this, and they most probably just stuck the book into the binding with the spine. So um, even further simplification of and this is what the uh, covers look like, the other side. Um, um, this is a book from India, um, 17, late 1700s. It's called the Padshanama. And uh, the cover is not, is, there's a lot of gold on it, but it's not gold tooled. Pieces of gold paper have been cut and put on it, stuck on it. And in some cases, the gold paper was stuck on, and then they took a tool, uh, 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 you know, a decorative tool, and went over the gold, gold paper to emboss the gold paper. So there's no gold leaf involved, apparently. Um, and it was in the hands of an Englishman, as were many of these things, but I think the owners, uh, the collector was Thomas Merton. and. Um, was re-sewn on um, supports. So, so I've been asked to, Yasmin, can you teach a class on Mughal binding or late Mughal binding? But I haven't found one which where the spine is intact. Um, because many of those books the, uh, were given, were either taken as booty or given to um, Britishers as gifts. And uh, they reformatted um, them to stand upright in their um, libraries. And here's a case um, where we're talking about inset and inlay of and reframing a text. Um, the Mughals were famous for sort of sort of taking that to the making the frame high art. Um, and uh, so this is one of the exemplars of that. Um, this is a much more quotidian binding again, a Quran. Um, 
and this is we're now in the British col colonial period in India, so they've tried to create an Oxford binding with um, tooled lines, and a four, but still keeping the four-edge flap and uh, putting false bands, sort of Franklin mint meets. So this is Java, um, history of Java, late 18th century, um, and it's written in Javanese, but the decoration, which I, I don't have the book open, unfortunately, a picture of that, is um, influenced by Ottoman um, Turkey, as shown in um, Professor de Roche's uh, um, slides. This book has been sewn multiple times, and this sewing, which is the mo most recent that we took off, um, was a chain stitch sewing, not a link stitch sewing. So similar to some of the earliest Islamic bindings that we have. Um, and, the, and the spine lining here, instead of being cloth, is um, an indigenous tapa material called tulwang, which is made from the paper mulberry. Um, so they used, it, it's basically a, a, a strong, very, very strong paper-like substance. So, so let's go back to Gulnar Bosch's uh, diagram, and we can see you don't need a forage flap. You actually don't need uh, your hinges to uh, your spine lining to attach to the book. Your end cap might be cut, by the way, the uh, and or it might be a tab sticking out, or it might be a fringe. So, and you can have squares. Your book it doesn't have to be the book doesn't have to be exactly flush with the boards. So, let's move on to damage and repair. So. One of the things that we find, I find, is that this part of the book is um, just leather. And as the leather shrinks, um, the book starts going concave here. Is it concave? Yep. And your boards start pulling back, and your book bulges in the front. And if that continues to happen, this is what you get. Um, and, and the leather on the spine shrinks. It's shrunk to such a position as here. And um, as that happens, you see it happening here, the pages in the front and the back start getting worn away. So I've never, this is the only one I've seen in this, in this particular um, position. And then you've got wormholes. Um, sorry, I got these mixed up. Um, and fractures along the verdigris line. And because of the persistence of wormholes in uh, the more uh, everyday manuscripts, which don't have um, ruled lines in, in copper and um, gold, um, there's a great impetus to re-frame re, um, the, the, the text. Um, and here you've got breaking copper lines. And this is often, you know, we get a book that looks like this. The text block is um, in one state, and the boards have just worn away and, and become really, really small. And it's, so I'm just going to walk you through um, what I see when I'm looking at a book. So this book, Ajayabe Makhlukat, which is about the wonders of creation, it was a, um, a sort of encyclopedic work. Um, I think written in the 13th century, with very, very popular. So this is a Persian uh, version of it. Um, this is a new piece of leather with the title on it. Um, the pasteboards are made up of um, manuscript waste in both sides, but we haven't opened them all up. We just left them as they are. And the spine is la overlapped. Each board is separate, and they're lapped on the spine, adhered to each other on the spine. Um, this is what the text block looked like, first page, um, heavily damaged. This is another Manassian number, um, and with lots and lots of repairs. So you open the book, 
we've got one repair, two repair, three repair, this is on top of that, that's on top of that. Um, and this is a very, so the whole impetus to re-margin a page and put nice borders um, as a decorative feature, but it's also a complete repair feature done in a very uh, um, modest manner here. Um, and there, there are two uh, programs of repair. This is another program of repair. This is another one. This is the first, this is the second. Um, this is one that didn't need to be extended because the pa paper size was right, lots of wear and tear. Um, and here, each of the sewing holes has been mended with a little patch. And that you find in pretty much every, um, the center of every folio by folio. And you can see evidence of um, damage, water damage. But again, the, the page leaves on the beginning and the end of the manuscript are much more um, susceptible to, to this because of the way the book is bound. Um, the book was, um, after binding, it was uh, sawn to make it flush the edges flush, and here you can see here um, a little fold which gives you the um, size that the book must have been before it was cut. And here, this was folded twice, so they were, it was cut twice. And um, here, this is the foredge, these little numbers show that they are little bits of manuscript ink left over showing the um, cut of the foredge. And if you look at the profile in the, of the, uh, from the, the bottom of the book, the tail of the book, you can see the saw marks here. But they don't come, so this is the front of the book and this is the back of the book, but you don't see them here. And the reason why is at this page, this is the original text and somebody went and copied the rest of the text, which must have been quite damaged, on a, on a newer sheet, on newer, newer paper. And this paper is a Western paper and has watermarks. And this paper is a Middle Eastern paper and does not have a watermark. Um, this paper is burnished in this direction and in this direction. This paper is only burnished in this direction and because the um, chain and laid lines go in this direction. So one of the things about this book is that they wanted to have both sides of the paper um, after treatment flow in the same manner. So the burnisher, the paper, the person, the bookmaker took that into account. Um, another thing we see is decoupage, um, where um, bits of uh, calligraphy Usually it's just calligraphy. Um, samples of calligraphy are adhered to, to create a decorative um, piece of art. And uh, borders may be uh, added, they may be painted separately, but everything, every little piece is a separate piece. This is separate, this, this, this. The borders, it's all cut and mounted together. And these, um, Overlays here show that it was part of a maraca album, something like this. This is a very uh, everyday version, um, so they would they would be read like like a book. You would open it, um, but it it opens into an accordion. And this particular piece, which I think is Indian, um, mainly from I don't know why I think that, but but. Here you've got one set. This is a leather uh, hinge that attached the pieces together. Then somebody mended it with um, green silk. And then they mended it with this cloth, which is only this little um, weave shows that this cloth, then, you know, you see a lot of parallel line weaves in, in the Middle East. But this particular um, black and white uh, thing shows that it was made in uh, southern Punjab. It's, it's a specific cloth that's a handloom cloth that's, that's made there and isn't made anywhere else. So this book was in, in northern India at some point. 
And this is the cover, which looks kind of Iranian to me. There's only one. Um, so here's another piece um, from the calligraphy collection. And I believe it's been identified as Eastern Kufic, 12th century. Um, and it is the heading, uh, the beginning of a surah of the Quran. That's the top that says, and then the first line. We look at it under, and this is also bought from Mr. Manassian. Um, and here there's a uh, um, Persian uh, glosses, glossary of some of the words up here. Um, looking at it under transmitted light, you see that there's an overlap here. And there was another one over here. So I had to take off the one over here because they wanted to read this. But here you can see the join on the verso. So it's a text that follows, the, the heading follows the, what's written over here. But what the relationship of these two is to each other, what the de was it the dealer who did this? How does this, it, it's, so we come across this quite a lot. And it's, it's, it's confusing and annoying for me as a conservator. Um, and then here we've got the remargining that I talked about before that I saw in this text. Late 19th century, um, the binding is an earlier, um, maybe 18th century binding. Um, it was a little longer than the text. Inside, it's definitely Indian. It's in an Indian language. Um, they've extended it top to bottom. They've put men's over here. Um, but when you look at this, this is English writing paper. It's letter writing paper, and it's embossed. It's got a little emboss that they used to emboss onion skin with. Um, there's nothing in it to show why it would have been extended at the head and tail, other than to put it in that binding. Um, inside was a little um, tab saying mid, I don't know what it says, Masnave Mir Hassan, with pictures, Persian book, India, unknown antique, SJ Tellerian Company, $6. This um, uh, person, SJ Teleri, he had the biggest antique emporium in India. He had two or three in each uh, big city, Calcutta, Bombay, New Delhi. And he was the person who was given the management of the, um, the India Pavilion in the New York World's Fair, in many of them. Actually, there were two or three at the, in the late 19th century. So he brought stuff from India to put in um, the World's Fair. And this is the library bought it for $6. And notice here, there's a, a number, one. There are quite a few of these charming um, miniatures in it. And um, each miniature is numbered consecutively. And I remember when I was a kid, my father used to buy manuscripts. He loved them. And in India, you would buy them. The value was based on the number of miniatures. And they'd always number them. So this, so this is something that it's, it's not, it's made as a tourist piece. They haven't taken something old and recycled it to make something new, as you often find in India and Iran nowadays. But they've just made something new and made it look older and recycled the cover. Um, so we don't have too much more. <clears throat> so this is. A Yusuf and Zalecha from the 16th century. <clears throat> this has been repainted. The hand is slightly different from the rest of the manuscript. This is the second page. It's got this lovely stencil. Um, the stencil looks a little solid, kind of like a Matisse. This is the older stencil. So the first six, the first gathering of this book was redone. The rest of it looks like this. This is after treatment. Um, and if look at, looking at this closely, um, usually when a manuscript was made, the gold lines were put in last. 
here, the ink, um, and this is not an inset. The text is not inset into these sheets. Um, the stencil um, design has, is over the gold and over the uh, writing in many cases. So it was put in later, after the manuscript was finished, was written. Um, these are the various colors that are in the manuscript. Um, so as I was looking at the manuscript, first I was told it was Lila and Majnoon, which is a completely different manuscript. Then I started reading it, and it's not Lila and Majnoon, it's Yusuf and Zuleika. So, um, and then I looked at it further and started doing a collation of the existing numbers. The numbers I took off, I wrote in the book as I took it apart, the existing numbers. Um, the way the, um, here, the way the colors, the page colors matched up, if there was an old repair, and other extant numbers in the book. And there are lots of extant numbers in new Arabic numerals and others in um, Persian numerals um, over here. And I realized that the book had been put together at some point to have the same colors open next to each other because somebody had gone in and ripped out many of the pages in an earlier iteration. Um, so here I have a Japanese tissue that implies that there were six leaves between this leaf and that leaf. But originally this leaf was right next to that leaf when I, when I got the book because they weren't, the book had been put together for sale to an unknowing, you know, an unknowing public, i.e., I assume, a West, an American library, like the Library of Congress. <laughs> um, so, I think that is pretty much where I end. So, basically, when I look at a manuscript, I always look at it with suspicion. And it has to prove to me, at least what I find at the library, it has to be, it has to prove to me that it is, there's an internal logic to it that makes sense in terms of the way the book was put together um, for a researcher. And if there's a logic that says that the book's put together for sale to an unknowing public or by a dealer just for sale as opposed to for research, I automatically um, have to go looking for a textual s scholar to come and really view the manuscript carefully before I put it back together. So this is a, um, so to end I want to just show you a few pictures from this book that was done in 1825 by, um, commissioned by James Skinner in India. He was half Indian, half British, and uh, one of a very key figure in the transfer of cultural knowledge between Indians and the British. So he translated um, Sanskrit texts into Persian, which was the language of the court and the language of the East India Company. And, um, and he commissioned a couple of volumes, copies of this particular book, Tashri Kalakvan, which is a compendium of the trades and the castes of India. And it's one of the first times that um, everyday people were depicted doing their work. And this person, and he had an atelier in his house, Skinner did in his uh, big hacienda, Haveli, and um, employed an artist. This is that artist mm -hmm. that he employed. And um, the British Museum has a copy, we have a copy, and then there are two other copies in private hands. I think somebody says there's a fifth, but the British, each copy has slightly different paintings or slightly different renditions of paintings. So here he is, um, it says Musavir, painter. He's painting and here is his student just doing decorative illumination. And again, um, Professor Jarosh talked about how um, people would do things at an angle, work at an angle, so here you see it. Um, this paint box is actually an early Winston and Newton paint box that was sent with uh, um, colonial 
officers to, it was designed for colonial officers to take to the UK. But putting the paints then in little shells is very traditional Indian. And this guy is doing really well. His clothes are beautiful. He, he gets paid quite a bit of money. Um, so this is the Katri, um, scribal caste, and this is his student. He is reading out so that the student is taking dictation. And often that was a bit trans how knowledge would be transmitted. Um, the scholar would read uh, from his text that he'd written, or the librarian would read from a text, and then the scribes would sit around and make copies. So here you have um, a case of this being um, happening. And this book looks very much like the cover of this actual book, the Tashrika Work Farm. Um, and uh, here is the Kargazi, the paper maker. Um, and tomorrow, uh, we're going to see a little video of traditional Indian paper making. And you'll see it's very, very similar. They're using exactly the same um, uh, mold, and uh, except the people are more, they've got more clothes on in the movie. <laughs> so um, with this, I'd like to thank you all and um, thank uh, the Mellon Sawyer um, Symposium organizers. Um, Tim Barrett, Paul Dilley, Catherine Tachau, and the goddess Melissa Merton, <laughs> Morton, and uh, all the graduate students who you will see tomorrow have done so much work and the conservation department at the University of Iowa. Thank you. And I have some more books to pass around. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the presentation. So I have a question and comment. I know that the word for book binding in Turkish is jilt evi, which means that the word refers to Arabic uh, leather. Mm -hmm. So in the earlier book binding in Turkish or Ottoman times, the main material for the cover was leather. Yeah. So you've shown us like the different book bindings from different parts of the Muslim world. So is the, is the like the leather was a common material were used for book binding or other materials? Um, sorry, I didn't make that clear. All the book bindings I showed were leather. And even when um, often in most cases, even when leather is used, even when other materials are used, there's an incorporation of leather in the frame. However, in the 19th century, you start seeing um, paper being used and just um, to make the covers and just leather on the spine. And I've actually seen uh, books from um, China where they're bound as ch like Chinese books but they've got Arabic um, text in them. So, you you know, there's, the more you travel, the more you see. <laughs> right. And the letter is for the durability. Um, I think for durability. I mean, leather is flexible. It, it just makes, it's an easier, it's an easier material to, um, and it's very flexible when you first make a book. As it ages, it may break down and it may become inflexible. And also it's a matter of tradition. It's beautiful to, uh, to uh, you can easily um, decorate it as you will see tomorrow. And actually the most complicated thing in making an Islamic binding is making the end band. Attaching the cover is also very, very easy. I mean, an, uh, uh, if you look at some of the tools that they had, they might have had a knife, a folder, an awl, a couple of uh, uh, tools to make designs with. But you don't need very much. And a mat and one brick, that should be enough. 
Um, no, thanks for that. That was fascinating. Uh, just a, a quick kind of technical question. You mentioned that the, the book from Morocco was stab bound. It's a big book block was, was stab bound. Do we know the, the choir makeup of that? I think it's, um, it's a printed book. Mm -hmm. it's an, um, and I think it's just by folio, but there, I couldn't look into the spine. And the ones at, um, in Qatar were all in either really good condition or they'd been rebound. And the rebinding, you couldn't open them either, because they were stab he stab sewed them again. Yeah, I wondered if, how practical that was, because uh, there's a papyrus book in the Chester Beatty Library that's supposed to be very early that appears from the whole pattern to have been yeah. stab bound, but it would be a very thick book block, and I just can't see how that would function. I, th I think um, I think it's if you've got single folios or one by folio, and you've got a lot of them, you can't. Like the Coptic ones, you just make a single choir. But if you had many bifolios, the the only way to attach them without sewing through each yeah. fold and then having a really big spine would be to stab sew it. And I think that's that, that's that's the route they took. Hmm. Gary, you had. <coughs> right ahead. Okay. Uh, it's got to be real simple. <laughs> it might be a simple answer, though. Yeah. That, that's the so. Uh, no, we really appreciate uh, your what we could call post-Western uh, reevaluation of uh, interpretation of the Oriental uh, mm -hmm. books. Uh, my simple question is. There's a very tentative structural relationship between the cover and the text. Yes. And if you look further east uh, into the Asiatic prototypes, uh, you'll find, as you know, that the over cover is in fact a separate enclosure, yeah. completely separate. And then you did in fact show some of the unsewn types that undoubtedly relied on the Quran cradle. But then, uh, the, if, if you will, the pre-Western uh, uh, slant or skew is that the overcover is actually attached to the, the book, the medieval yeah. book. And so it, it, I'm asking, is the Islamic, in fact, doing a transmission that includes a transition? of the book from the Eastern to Western? I don't know. I mean, I think the first thing is the paper was thicker, the Islamic paper. So it was, it had a, a certain heft. And the cover was, um, you know, we never got to stage three of the destruction of the cover. Usually by stage two, it got concave and the boards fell off. Um, so what you see is actually the text block stays the book block stays together when the covers come off. And um, so as with the Yusuf and Zuleika, my text block was complete. And with the treatment of the um, Ajaybe Makhlukat, my text block was complete. And so there's the tentative relationship of the cover to the uh, uh, book block um, makes it easy to recase and reembortage the book over and over again because you've got a really um, healthy book book market. There's got lots of literacy. It's it's a very easy way to keep books in circulation. It doesn't take long to make your cover, and and, and pretty much anybody can do it. Thank you. Okay, we are quickly are going to meet.